Hello, everyone. Hi. Thank you all for joining today. So I'd like to start out by uh, painting a little bit of a scene for you. So the year is 2019. You're an engineer for a big company, and you manage a bunch of infrastructure, vault clusters, Kubernetes clusters, Cassandra clusters, Kafka clusters. And you've terraformed everything already, which is great. You got your infrastructure and code. And you spent, say, the last week, two weeks, deploying a big set of changes out to your environment. And you come in one morning, and you get a bunch of alerts that says, you had a script that failed, and it caused an outage. So if your infrastructure looked anything like ours did about a year ago, maybe two years ago, you're going to be getting ready for a pretty long week or two. You know, at that point, you're going to be getting ready to fix that bug, get it committed into your repo, uh, pull, uh, pull request in. You're going to be testing it in pre-production, making sure that it works, and then slowly rolling it out to every single instance of that cluster that you have out in your environment. So it sounds great, right? What's wrong with that picture, though? Well, it starts to feel a bit like an assembly line. You make your changes, and then all you're doing for the next week is rolling them through your environments. It gets very repetitive. Uh, we've got very smart, very talented engineers on our team, and we think that there's a better use for their time. So how can we make that time, put that time to better use? Well, there's a couple of things. I mean, first thing that comes to mind is we could just hire more people, and then we get the job done faster. But uh, it takes time to find people, and, and takes time to train them. Um, takes time to get them up to speed. Uh, we've also taken a look at cloning, um, but you know there's a gestational period of 40 weeks, and then we got to wait another 16 years after that before we can legally hire them. So and it doesn't quite work with our timelines here. So assume that you have the team that you have available today. You're probably not going to grow very quickly. How can we fundamentally change the way that we approach our infrastructure? to basically regain some of that engineering time. That's what we really want to be doing, right? So we really want to inspire you today to take a look at your infrastructure as code that hopefully you're, you're working towards already or already have, and think about it from a software engineering perspective to maybe help you get some of that engineering valuable time back, right? So. All right, so again, we are, I'm Ryan Hild. I'm Mike G. And we're part of the Cloud Foundation Services Platform team. And uh, what we've been doing is for the past couple of years, we've been providing uh, infrastructure and services for uh, some of our internal customers at Starbucks. Our big value add is that we allow teams to develop their applications and come in and host themselves on our platform. And we provide a, a platform that's built up and managed by us. And it's secure by default. So a little bit about Starbucks. Um, Starbucks is a fairly large company. I think most of you have probably heard of us. Based here in Seattle, uh, we have over 30,000 stores across the globe. And in those stores, we have 380,000 partners. Uh, partners is what we call our employees. It's a pretty large company. Um, we're spread across 80 countries. And every week, we get up to 100 million impressions. And that's face-to-face uh, -face interactions with customers. Last year, we had nearly $25 billion in revenue. As you can imagine, we're doing that basically a cup of coffee at a time. So it's really important that the company runs like a well-oiled machine, that the technology behind the company is, is scalable and very reliable and secure. Our mission as Starbucks is to inspire and nurture the human spirit, one person, one cup, and one neighborhood at a time. And we really try to make sure that as Starbucks engineers, we practice this through our own technology as well. Our team was formed a few years ago around a specific purpose, and that purpose was to deliver the Starbucks Rewards Program to the Japan market. So we put together a View Zero iteration of our architecture for that, and this included putting our, our module, our organizing our code by modules. So we had Vault, Kubernetes, Kafka, Terraform, all organized into their own repositories. We created repositories for the shared components that we used. So that when we put together our networks, we could do that in a repeatable manner. And then finally, we put each of our environments together in a different repo so that we could get a picture of what all was deployed into a given environment just by looking at that repository. So some advantages to this approach. Uh, it was really clear when you were going into GitHub and digging around code, you knew exactly what you were working with. You know, what set of, what 
type of infrastructure you're working with, where it was, was it production, non-production, et cetera. Um, also, when we did the component module design, we had a very clear uh, release cycle. So when we would come up with new features, we'd tag those and get them deployed from pre-production through production. And finally, we, we were, like I said, infrastructure as code is really important. So we had essentially achieved that from the beginning. We did have the advantage of going in Greenfield, which helped. There's also some downsides. We found that, that this organization led to us having a lot of different repositories to manage. So we had to constantly be changing which repository we were working with. This also led to some variation in each repository. So we would get where our engineers would make a change to deploy into a given environment, and then they wouldn't make that change to every other en environment. And so we were getting a little bit of drift in between our environments, even though we were already using infrastructure as code in this way. Occasionally, people would sometimes skip uh, pre-production and go straight to production as well, which is awesome, right? So that's just what you want. <laughs> uh, so shortly after we launched the Starbucks Rewards program in Japan, which was successful, um, we really focused on our next effort, which was taking that same project and scaling it up for North America. Um, so for this next iteration, we wanted to solve some of the problems that we, that we ran into with the first uh, design. And one thing we decided to do was go with a mono repo structure. So instead of having re repositories for every single environment and every single thing, we just had one run repository for non-production, one repository for production. Inside of those repositories, we, design, we defined our environments by a folder structure, and we put all of the definition of Terraform modules inside of that. Um, we also took uh, outputs and remote state um, as data references from Terraform, and we uh, put them in a shared file, and we symlinked them everywhere, um, which had some benefits, but some problems as well, as you'll see. And uh, finally, we, had, uh, we took our component modules. Uh, again, the components were Vault, Kubernetes, Kafka, Cassandra, et cetera. We took those uh, component module repositories, and we made them de-iceable. So I'm sure you all know what de-iceable means. You heard that term 100 <laughs> times before. Uh, actually, probably not. <laughs> so we should probably go over that. So when you think about infrastructure, uh, one of the common patterns in DevOps is you want to treat your infrastructure as cattle, not pets. Well, another way to think about that is you don't want to build snowflakes. You do not want your infrastructure to be unique and different and special, because then anything that comes along could be breaking to that. So really, we want to eliminate all of our snowflakes. And we found that the best tool to do that we, it was even better when we called it the de-icer. So uh, this is a sample of uh, kind of what our early de-icer configuration would look like. Uh, it would reference the repository where the module code could be found. It would have the version tag that you wanted to release, the network that it belonged in, and then the various parameters that we defined for, for that comp uh, component. So. All right, so back to our overall architecture of the V1. Again, we've had some benefits that we found through this. There was fewer repositories to manage, which was definitely one of our original pain points. We found that achieving parity between our environments is now easier because these configuration files were living all right next to each other. And then we finally were able to share resources easier because now, like we mentioned, it was just that simulating to remote state, and then we just use that throughout all of our projects. And some downside to this design, which we did have uh, pull requests got really nasty. Uh, you'd be digging around in the code to figure out what changed. Sometimes it would be three or four different components uh, it required a lot of discipline to make sure that our engineers were only changing specific things uh, in a PR. It became challenging to automate. So when we did start to think about automation, you know, you have to dig around inside of a, a commit and figure out what, what changed, what do you action, what do you ignore. Um, sometimes that could get very hairy. And then finally, uh, because the components were using this uh, shared remote state everywhere, we ended up with the component code having a really rigid API. Like it expected the output from another component to be there from the specific remote state file. It was just, if we wanted to tear it apart, it was gonna be a nightmare, right? I see a few people nodding your heads like you've experienced this same sort of pain. <laughs> so we took a look at that and we successfully delivered our North America launch. But you know, we still wanna to continue to develop our platform forward. So we tried to identify some things that were good from that design and we wanted to carry forward, but also we wanted to make some changes. Uh, the biggest problem and the biggest change that we were dealing with is North America has a lot bigger scale. 
uh, with our Japan versus our North America launch, we had about four times the infrastructure. So we decided to make another iteration, and when we did that, we set out to, with some goals. So our goals for this, for this next iteration, we wanted to make sure that our deployments were actually automated. We didn't want engineers running Terraform Apply, ideally. We wanted to make sure that operational tasks outside of Terraform were also automated. Uh, for example, when you deploy a change to a vault cluster, an engineer would have to go uh, destroy instances so new ones would come up. So we wanted that to be automatic. Uh, we also wanted to have automated testing in place so that we knew that the system was healthy throughout this process. And then finally, we were looking to make sure that we had consistency across all of our environments, same versions of everything were deployed everywhere, and that the platform from our customer's perspective internally was also consistent. So they were always interfacing with a known quantity, right? So these are the goals that we put together, and you know, we decided to create a set of pipelines for our infrastructure. And we organized this by component, and uh, for the remainder of this talk, we'd actually like to walk you through kind of some of those changes that we made to each of our components and what that process looked like and, and where we ended up from it. Cool. So um, just before we go down that road, I uh, wanted to talk about, or before we start talking about the specifics, if you're thinking about your own infrastructure right now and you're thinking about you know, what could I adapt into a pipeline type model, uh, there's a few things we wanted to talk about um, that you might want to have as uh, prerequisites uh, when you're selecting something. So, uh, so little height requirements before you start down the path. F you want your infrastructure to be declarative, so you want to be using Terraform uh, or Docker or something of that nature. Um, you want to have standardized tooling and scripts. So from pre-production through production, you're running the same scripts on every cluster uh, with parameters if needed. Um, and then also you want to make sure that you have metrics available so that as you're deploying things, you can query and say, like, is this system healthy across the board, right? So if you already have some infrastructure that kind of matches that profile, that's a really good place to start. If you don't, pick one that's easy to uh, adapt these things to and then start with that. So the first thing um, that we put together was taking a look at automating our Terraform. And uh, this is really, actually just how many of you out there are currently using Terraform? Okay, and how many of you are actually automating your Terraform plans and applies? It's good. All right, so if you haven't put together automation for your Terraform already, here's a couple of uh, just key points for you. You want to make sure you develop your scripts so that you have some repeatable runs. You want to make sure that this is running the same way in automation that you would run it on a development machine to debug what problems you're going to run into. And we found that it really helped to put these into containers. So when you run Docker, you get that consistent environment, that consistent setup every single time. And uh, for us, remote state management became very important. We had to be very prescriptive about how we would organize our, our environments and then our components within those environments. So uh, that operational uh, activities that I kind of mentioned earlier, rolling clusters, that type of thing, um, scaling that was really important for us, and when you want to scale those things, it really means automating them, right? So um, this means really removing the hands-on activity. You don't want your engineers in there uh, running scripts every time a change happens, ideally. So uh, there are a few different things that we want to talk about uh, as far as automating goes. What do you want to automate? Ideally, you want things that your team already has processes for, uh, you probably don't want to go in and start automating something that you've never done. Uh, it's highly recommended that you, at the very least, have um, something like a do-nothing script, which is something that's worked really well for us, which is essentially a script that prints commands out to a terminal, the engineers follow that process, hit a key to go to the next step. It sounds kind of silly, but it works really well. And then you can take those scripts and start plugging in your, your own script uh, automation code inside of that, and eventually you've got a fully automated process. Um, now, things like uh, pre-deploy testing, so is the cluster in a good state? Am I ready to deploy? Um, yeah. yeah, update execution, so our, we deployed a lot of vault clusters and we used auto-scaling groups to do so. Uh, so our update process would actually be, we'd go out there, update the launch configuration, and then terminate the old instances after we'd made the Terraform apply happen. And that was how we rolled out our, our changes to the vault infrastructure. We'd also include things like post-deploy testing, so uh, after we finish this update, we'd you know, run a few uh, checks, run through some testing, and validate that our tenants could actually still connect to this cluster, generate new tokens, actually use the secrets inside of it. 
And uh, we also had a, a rollback process documented. It was pretty much just doing the same thing in reverse, but putting us back into that known good state that we could work with. When we focused on putting these things into code, we wanted to make sure that we were using tools that our developers were familiar with. If you have an engineer that's never worked with Golang before and they've suddenly got to debug why this isn't working in production, you might have a few issues there. So we made sure to choose tools that our, our team was comfortable picking up and learning with. Now when you go to automate your operations, don't forget guardrails. So if, especially if you're running data stores or things where you could have corruption, uh, make sure you put it, use your lifecycle hooks, um, lose, use prevent destroy in your Terraform, um, make sure you're testing the integrity of your data before and after you roll out. So that leads us into talking about just kind of how do we test our, our platform as a whole. And we came up with a few different questions for that, which is basically, you know, what kind of testing do I need, how many tests do I need, and what kind of tests am I going to be running? So when we took a step back and we thought about, okay, how do we answer these questions for our platform, it really brought us back to thinking about where we were. Again, we deployed into North America and Japan. We kind of set an expectation for that security. We had a stability aspect to what we were deploying. Our, our developers are very used to how things were and they didn't want things to break without them being warned ahead of time. So really when we approached testing, we approached it as using it to increase the stability of our platform. So look into that first question a little bit more. What types of tests do you want to think about running? Uh, really, there's two categories that you want to think about. Uh, functional tests really is, is the system operating the way that you expect it to. And then non-functional tests, which are more about is the system healthy, uh, is the user interface to that system uh, what you expect it to be, et cetera. Um, so for functional tests, you're looking at, uh, again, coming from like a development background, unit tests, which are going to be testing small bits of the infrastructure, um, integration tests, uh, system and acceptance tests. tests sorry. We also want to make sure we don't forget about our performance of our system. If we have a really low latency right now, and that's kind of an expectation of our downstream consumers, we need to sure make, make sure we have that under test so that we don't break that without knowing about it beforehand. We also need to make sure that we have uh, good compatibility testing. Our interface to our tenants is just a Docker API, and so there's a lot of range for different ways they could configure that. So we need to make sure that we stayed stable with the features that they were using. So what, now that we've identified kind of the tests that we need to write, um, the next question is how many of those do I need to write? And what really helps here is thinking about the testing pyramid. I've also recently seen the uh, testing ice cream cone where it's just inverted. Uh, but the, the whole idea here is you think about how many tests uh, you're going to write based on the speed at which they run and the cost they have to maintain. If you have a bunch of small, very targeted tests, those are typically referred to as unit tests, and those will typically run faster and you'll run them much more often. When you put that together into a higher level and you test several components at the same time, that's what we refer to by service tests. Um, and then at the top of the testing pyramid, you have your UI tests because that's where you, know, you write one test and it tests a bunch of functionality underneath the covers. So when you think about this and how to apply this for your team, what you need to understand is what kind of value are you bringing to your team by writing this test? If you put together a framework that tests a component that's not gonna get deployed and except for in maybe one or two instances, there might be better ways to test your, uh, to spend your time. So finally, uh, from the testing standpoint, we're gonna talk about how and where you're gonna run these tests. Uh, often you're gonna have developers that are running them locally on their machine. Uh, and that's ideal because you want to get fast feedback. You want to know if you broke something. Um, it's not always possible. So you want to make sure they're easy to run. Um, your objective is really to make sure that people can figure out what's broken, right? So if you finally get to the pipeline stage and you've made your changes, they seem to work locally, uh, but something fails at, say, the deployment stage, um, you want to make sure that your developers can take, roll back and basically rerun that locally and debug it and figure out what went wrong. Um, and then uh, uh, beyond that, you're gonna have them running inside the pipeline itself. So we talked about kind of pre-deployed tests. You might have gates at each stage before you move on from a pre-production to a production environment. Um, and then you're gonna have one-off events, which would be things like you're upgrading a major version of uh, your data store and you need to migrate the data over, right? So you might have scripts that you develop for those specific purposes, right? Mm 
Yeah, and we actually found that when we started writing tests for our one-off events, and then we started putting those into our repositories and managing them the rest of our code, mm -hmm. those tests would actually be reusable, uh, both if we, for whatever reason, needed to perform a similar migration in the future, or if we wanted to just add another check that, for our smoke test. So after we're done deploying, make sure this thing still works the way it did before that chain feature was even introduced. Yeah. I guess it doesn't make too much sense, but. <laughs> so finally, we wanted to get into the, the meat of the talk which is really about the pipelines themselves. Um, so here's just a, kind of a simple uh, chart de describing the flow that we, that we developed internally. Um, what we were going for was a standard prescriptive process that we could apply to all of our components across the board, whether it was uh, strictly Terraform code or Kubernetes deployment or whatever it was, um, what was kind of the lowest common denominator and develop all of the scripts and tooling to match that pattern and then stamp that out for every component. Uh, what you get is uh, basically like a multiple cycles at the end to promote through different stages. So if in our case, we have an alpha, beta, gamma, and prod stage. So that loop would happen where you um, promote the code, deploy it to that environment, run all of your post-apply tests, and if they're successful for every instance of that environment, then you can proceed to the next one. If any single one of those failed, you would uh, cancel that change and the developer would want to figure out what went wrong. So what does that actually look like? Well, we wrote a configuration file and we kind of put together a format that was very prescriptive about these pieces that we wanted to include. You notice that we have our stages defined and these are very prescriptive names that we use so we always have a validation field that performs our PR checks. We we'll always have a build that produces our binary artifacts that we're going to use as well as compiles any tooling that we're gonna use during update execution or that uh, smoke testing after we deploy. We also have defined our publishing stage, uh, which is actually how our artifacts are tagged or you know, whatever it is that we chose to do for that particular component, but that's what marks it for being ready for deployment. And then you can start to see at the bottom here a little bit of how we define our deployments. And we would define a, an arbitrary grouping there and it would, we are able to target specific pieces of infrastructure and kind of deploy through them in sequence. So taking this, that file you were just looking at would be a deploy config YAML file for a given component. Uh, and as you can see from the sample folder structure, this would live inside the component repository as well. And this is borrowing from our mono repo designs. We would define every place where there's a cluster. Um, so each individual file represents an instance of that component, and inside of that would be a deicer config with all of the uh, parameters that are needed. Uh, the nice thing about this design, when you look at a PR, um, there's a, maybe a single change that's happening if it's like an instance size or something like that, and you get a um, nice small blast radius, which is good. So again, coming back to this, once we define those uh, deicer configuration files, we go ahead and reference every one of those that we actually wanted to deploy and manage. We'd reference it in, in our deployment stages at, at the bottom here. So just like our deicer tool transformed a configuration into Terraform, we also wrote a tool to transform this configuration into very opinionated Terraform. So we'd run that tooling and then we'd immediately be able to run uh, Terraform init and Terraform apply and we would produce our pipelines within AWS code pipeline. Yeah, so again, these, uh, this code pipeline you're looking at now is defined in Terraform as well. There's uh, providers for uh, code pipeline and code build. So we leverage that to translate our, our pipeline definition into what you see here. And this is the top uh, stage of that deploy config. Um, what gets generated is essentially a source based on a GitHub webhook. Um, when a commit goes into master, it triggers the pipeline and first goes through a build stage. What the build stage does is essentially bundle, uh, take all of the Terraform templates, it compiles any tooling that we included in that. Like I mentioned, like the uh, node roller or the roller for vaults, that would be a tool that gets compiled in this exact process. Uh, any images, Docker images that get built, and they would uh, be packaged up for future delivery. Uh, then we would run tests for, um, for our build. Uh, we would run uh, Terra test. So we'll stand up a temporary um, instance of that uh, component, uh, run a test suite against it, make sure it does what we expect. And if everything looks good, we'll finally publish that uh, complete bundle as an artifact to the deployment stage. <laughs> 
All right. Uh, deployment stage kind of looks a little bit like this. So what we see is we basically have three phases. Uh, we have a plan, we have an approval stage, and then we go to an apply. I wonder where we got that from. <laughs> so during our plan stage, we actually do run Terraform plan, and we perform a few other checks based on uh, whichever component we're working with. Uh, we then send that output to our approval stage, where we have an engineer look at it and decide whether it's good to go or not. Now, this has all been done in parallel, so when they move on to the apply stage, those clusters are all deployed in parallel, they're rolled in parallel, and then they're tested in parallel. Good. Okay. So uh, we also wanted to touch on uh, just kind of this grouping here uh, is really uh, provided a lot of power. We can write focused tools that target a single instance, and they'll work on that same targeted single instance the same way that they do in alpha, and the same way they do through beta, all the way up through our production environments. So by the time any tooling or any code gets all the way out to production, we know that it's been tested against every single one of our clusters in exactly the same way it's going to be used. We also found that by having uh, an approval stage right there, we can hook into that and say, if we wanted to you know, output to Slack to tell our engineers that there's a new approval, that's where we started. But then this allows us to do a lot of iteration. So we can say, all right, now go inspect those plan files that were generated and tell me how many changes were going through there. If we have other things that we want to check, we can add that into the pipeline and check those outputs and just do that as iteratively in our pipeline. And just to go back to that visual, uh, this is, again, what you, what you end up with uh, logically. So again, we get uh, consistent environments. Um, we have a standardized config format that defines this thing. Same scripts are being run everywhere for every instance of that component. And it integrates really well with Terraform. So you're probably thinking, like, how do I get there? It seems like a lot. Uh, where do I start, right? So uh, think, again, about all of your infrastructure. Try and target something that you know really well is very simple. Um, so our team, we started with console. Console is a known quantity. It's a simple thing to manage operationally. And the Terraform itself was also very simple. So that was our first MVP for uh, pipelines. And then once you get that out, don't stop there. Keep iterating. Keep adding tests. Keep adding scripts and then start adapting your other components based on what you've learned. So it's really about just constantly making little changes. Don't try and do everything at once. It won't work. This gave us a lot of power because it allowed us to evolve that design. Even though this was all part of our V2, the actual design of our pipelines has definitely changed over that. And we've allowed it to start from a couple minds trying to build that big idea of what we're building, and then we gradually introduced it to the rest of the team to where we can collaborate. And if someone finds a feature of this pipeline that's not implemented yet, they have the power to go make a pull request and make that actually happen for everyone. So in conclusion, if you take the time and invest your time towards developing these types of automation, these types of pipelines, in a software engineering kind of approach, you're gonna end up with a lot more time to do other uh, valuable work you can be able to build new features. You're going to get rid of a lot of the operational tasks that are bogging you down. Also, you're going to get this really powerful ability to insert new logic. Uh, for example, if you wanted the uh, cost analysis features that have been demonstrated, uh, you could build something like that into your pipelines. If you wanted auditing or compliance checks, you can do that as well. It's really completely up to you. And because you've developed the skills to manage these things internally, the sky's the limit, pretty much. Um, and finally, it really, for us, has been um, a source of happiness. Everyone has more free time. They're not doing stuff that they don't want to do. So you end up with a happier team altogether, which is really nice. So finally, um, Starbucks, again, we are a technology company. We employ top-tier technologists. We're focusing on creating in-house solutions for opportunities that we have as a company. And it's really, really cool stuff. So if you'd like to talk more with us after, uh, come find us. Again, my name is Mike G. I'm Ryan Hill. And thank you so much for your time today. Appreciate it.